Hey, it's Hawken with Shotgun Diagnostics. Today I wanted to make a short video kind of explaining some of the stuff that I see frequently that is misunderstood with respect to programming. Uh, module programming is what we're talking about here. So we're going to do a video. This video is essentially like a 40,000 foot uh, high level overview of programming. We're not going to get into nitty gritty details with respect to specific vehicle manufacturers or anything like that. Um, this is more meant to give you kind of a an understanding of what exactly programming is, uh, how we're going to accomplish it in broad terms, what kind of tooling is required, uh, some of the specific things that seem to be often either A, misunderstood, or B, overlooked by a lot of people who try to get into this. Uh, I get a lot of questions from people who think that they can just go out and get a J2534 and program any module or you know just use any old laptop and program any module um, so there's a lot of stuff like that that just there's really a lack of knowledge in the field so I wanted to take a little bit of time to explain this and go into a little bit of explanation uh, or detail and like I said we're not going to get into a bunch of nitty-gritty details on specific OEMs but I did want to get into at least some high-level detail that should help you have a better grasp on what we're talking about when we talk about programming. All right, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and go into our slideshow here. So uh, this is just a picture of a module here you see up on the screen. Uh, again, the class is meant to be, or the video, is meant to be like a 40,000-foot overview. Nothing real specific or in-depth for the most part, okay? So here's an overview of kind of what we're going to talk about, uh, again, in a very brief and overall limited fashion, but should clarify some misconceptions and give you a little bit more understanding of the overall topic of programming. Uh, so you're going to ask yourself, when is it required? We're going to get into that. We're going to talk a little bit about how we accomplish programming, what kind of tools are required, what are the different options for tooling, what are the limitations of that tooling, depending on which tooling we decide to use. And, uh, you know, also some of the other things respective to uh, programming related to computers. So uh, when, I, when I say computers, I, I mean PCs. Uh, if we're using PCs to do programming, which is what you have to do with OEM software, um, there's some very specific things you need to be aware of with respect to that that a lot of people are not. And I get a lot of uh, technical calls and concerns where people fundamentally lack an understanding of just what's really required. Uh, again, I'm not here to reinvent the wheel or to try and teach you an entire class. I just want to give you some basics, and then I want to refer you to some resources that I think will help you if you're going to go down this road and start doing programming, because there are some very good aftermarket resources, training companies, and tool retailers who can help you get to the point where you can actually do this competently. Uh, the other considerations we're going to talk about uh, is the differences between OEM dealer sold modules, aftermarket remanufactured modules, and uh, used modules, which is a really, really complicated topic. And again, we're not going to get into the specifics. That's something you're going to need to do some further education of yourself in order to have a deeper understanding of. But again, we'll give you some resources of where you can go get this information and how you can get educated on that topic. Okay, so first thing you're going to ask yourself, what is programming, right? We want to know what it is that we're discussing here. So I like to think of programming essentially as the software and the firmware for a control module. So when we talk about uh, a PC, for instance, if you build a PC or you buy a PC, the manufacturer of the physical hardware, so the processor, the motherboard, the RAM, all of that stuff, they have firmware, which is what physically runs that hardware, uh, and then they also have software, which is like your operating system. Modules have the same thing. They have firmware and they have software. It's very much similar to a PC in that sense, uh, at least in my mind. Some people might view it a little differently, but that's kind of the way I like to think about it. Now. You're asking yourself, okay, so what does this mean for me? Well, we need to understand when we're going to be updating or providing uh, programming to a module. So the situations when we are going to be doing programming to a module would be, we'll skip forward here just to a second, when a, when a control module gets replaced, so whether we're replacing a brand new unit, uh, 
in some cases a remanufactured unit or a used unit. Now we're going to get into some more detail on some of that a little bit farther. So we're going to go back here. But I also wanted to lay out what the difference is between coding and programming and also service resets. Uh, I didn't put anything in the slideshow about service resets because that's really not what we're trying to talk about here with respect to this overall video. But I would like to clarify what each of these are. So programming, again, we're talking about the physical software and firmware that runs the control module. This is something that actually gets flashed into the control module and helps, allows the control module to operate, right? It has to have this stuff in order to actually power on and do anything. If it doesn't have this, it, it can't do it. Now, some modules come with software already on them from the dealer. Uh, most of them, if not all of them, typically come with some level of firmware already on them. Uh, and then, obviously, there is also situations where we will be uploading those things using software of our own, right? Coding is different from programming. This is a completely different thing. Uh, it gets confused very frequently, and a lot of people blur the lines between the two and run the two of them together and make it into a, it's the same thing. It's not. Coding is done to tell a module things like what kind of options are enabled on the car. So an example, as you can see here in the slideshow, whether or not the vehicle has an automatic or a manual transmission, whether or not the vehicle has automatic HVAC or manual HVAC, whether or not the vehicle has a passive or a direct TPMS system, things like that. Uh, I like to think of Ford as built data as one of the forms of coding, if you will. Volkswagen Audi is another one that a lot of folks are familiar with that term. Again, what that is is a type of data that we are telling the module, hey, this is the exact vehicle you're in, this is the exact equipment level this vehicle has, so here are the different options you need to turn on or off in the module capabilities, right? So that's the way I like to think about coding. Again, coding is like telling the module specific information about what options it needs to have configured or available. Sometimes there's also secondary things like parametrization. Uh, Volkswagen likes to use that terminology. Um, that's another type of telling the module which vehicle it's in and what kind of features and equipment that it has and what things it needs to turn on, if you will. Uh, software, again, or programming specifically, is again, we're talking about like the operating system or the firmware of the module, which again is different. You could program a module and you could give it all the software and firmware it needs and it might not work correctly still. Why? Because maybe it hasn't been given the coding. If it is not given the coding and told which specific vehicle it's in, depending on vehicle manufacturer, it may still not function completely correctly. Now, this is dependent on vehicle manufacturer. Some vehicle manufacturers handle all of the telling the module which options it has and things of that nature through the programming process. Other manufacturers separate that process into two steps, programming and coding. So again, keep that in mind. This just kind of illustrates all the different rabbit holes and caveats to the whole subject of programming and of course also coding that you need to educate and familiarize yourself on if your plan is to start doing this type of work and be knowledgeable and competent at this. It's just a little overview graphic from Volkswagen that I wanted to share. So you can see the little yellow line basically indicating this is the information that's traveling out from the car into the factory interface, which they would call the VAS 6154A. That's the current iteration of the OEM interface. This information is being pulled from the control units. It's being compared to a database. The database is saying, okay, which hardware part number do you have? Which software part number do you have? What's the VIN of the vehicle? It's comparing, it's looking at the build sheet of the vehicle. What equipment level was the vehicle equipped with from the factory? Has there been any changes to the software that we need to account for? Uh, are there updates related to the software? It's reconciling that data from the car that it's pulling out of the car. Then it's going into the database and making all those calculations and figuring out all of that information. Then it is sending back data through the servers, through the OE interface and everything. And it's saying, hey, there is a new flash file for this module. If it's brand new or if there's a TSB related update, 
and then it's also checking to see what specific coding or identity the module requires based on the VIN or equipment level. And same thing with the parameter data. So again, this is kind of the two-way process of communication that happens during a programming and potentially a coding event. So I thought this would be a useful graphic just to kind of visually understand what exactly is happening in the process. Now again, it's going to vary by vehicle manufacturer exactly what data is being transferred and pulled and you know sent back to the module and whatnot, but this is a good overall concept so you can understand what's happening. Okay, so we had a hardware failure there, so that was lovely. Uh, my headset apparently just decided to crap out in the middle of the video, so we had to switch headsets. So again, getting back to things, we wanted to just talk about, again, when we're doing programming, it's related to usually one of two things. When a control module is replaced, or when we are updating something in the software or firmware as a result of a TSB. So manufacturers will release TSBs or recalls in some cases, which are typically going to be completed at the dealer, but sometimes don't get completed at the dealer. And those TSBs may mandate that you update software on a module. Now, why would they have a TSB that tells you to uh, make an off, excuse me, update to software? Uh, things like code setting criteria is maybe too tight. So a great example would be a P0420. Maybe the ECM is looking at the algorithm it uses to determine catalyst efficiency and the parameters that they programmed in from the factory were too stringent or uh, inaccurate in some fashion. And so they're getting a large volume of vehicles come in with a P0420 when the catalyst is in fact not actually bad. Um, so that'd be a good example of a situation where there might be a reflash, right? There could be other things, uh, you know, and we'll go through a couple examples here just so you can kind of see. Uh, but anyhow, those are typically the two situations where we're gonna see software uh, programming is necessary. All right. So here's an example uh, with respect to Volkswagen. Volkswagen had a bulletin that's like a master sheet for a large number of vehicles where there was an update to software to address a specific issue. So if we look at the table here, we've got some examples. So the top example here, we got a Tureg uh, with a 3.0 CATA engine. CATA is just the engine designation. Uh, any of those specific codes that are set, they are saying, okay, you're gonna check the module part number and then when they're talking about the software part number really is what they're discussing here. And then they tell you that there is an updated software level to reflash the module to. And then they give you the specific action code you have to enter into the software in order to complete the update. Uh, they also tell you the TSB number where all of the specifics of that update of software uh, can be found. So again, every manufacturer is a little different but a lot of manufacturers, when it's a TSB related software update, will have a specific TSB that walks you through all of the different things they want you to do uh, in order to update the software. Now, sometimes in those TSBs, there's gonna be hardware changes as well. So here's an example where a hardware change is potentially also required. So Hyundai has an issue here. We see this is a seven speed dual clutch transmission. Uh, we've got a large number of vehicle applications that they give us here all the specific criteria to evaluate whether it applies or doesn't apply to a vehicle we're working on. Then they go into labor and tell us, you know, what the labor operations are. And then they talk about, okay, so there's some potential hardware modifications that have to be done. We see there's a troubleshooting flow diagram. Vehicle comes in, there's a judder, clutch judder inspection. It's not okay. We do a TCU or TCM upgrade. Then we repeat the inspection process. If it's still not good, then they want us to do a hardware revision in addition to the software revision. So again, every manufacturer is gonna be different. Each TSB is gonna be different, but it's important to understand that sometimes this is just gonna be a physical software modification. Other times we're gonna be dealing with something where there's a software and a hardware modification. So again, just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about programming. Now, we're gonna get into the how is programming accomplished, right? There are essentially four different ways that I like to think of uh, with respect to how programming is accomplished. So option one is cloud-based programming. Many aftermarket scan tools have this as an optional feature that is subscription-based, so you have to have a valid and active subscription in order to have access to this. 
And if your subscription is valid and active, you will have access to a programming database. Now you're asking yourself, what does that do for me, right? So essentially what these cloud-based programming databases are is a collection of software files for various vehicle manufacturers that reside on a centralized server. So Autel has something like this, iScan has something like this, Topdon has something like this, and there are other scan tool manufacturers that do it do as well. Now you're asking yourself, okay, so is this a one-stop shop? Can I program every car? Can I you know, do every Volkswagen? Can I do every BMW, et cetera? No, you cannot. Now, you're asking yourself, well, why not? The reason being is, is that the databases with each of these scan tool manufacturers are not comprehensive, right? Each one of these scan tool manufacturers has some of the programming files for some of the modules on some of the vehicles. So if we said, hey, I've got a BCM on an Audi, Autel might have the file on their database, or they might not. iScan might have the file on their database, or they might not. Topdon might have the file on their database, or they might not. Now, the one thing I will say is if you have more tools that have soft, uh, cloud-based software programming options, you have a better likelihood that one of your tools will have the file, right? Because usually the database in each tool is different, so the statistical likelihood that you will have access to the file through one of your tools is higher if you have more tools. Now, again, doesn't matter how many tools you have, you will never be completely covered by this service. This is just a nice option to have at your disposal. It can be faster than flashing with the OEM uh, interface or J2534, and we'll get into those a little bit more here in the next couple of slides. But just wanna clarify again, each of these solutions from the cloud-based programming is not a comprehensive solution. It is not all-encompassing. They will not have every file for every module, even on a brand where they list coverage. And that's not their fault, right? The only way that anyone can have every file is to be the OEM, right? That's it. Doesn't matter. The only person who has all the files is the OEM, period, end of story. That's it. So just keep that in mind uh, when you are using these services. Again, excellent resource. It can bail you out in a jam. You can t sometimes selectively program a module when the OEM might not allow you to. Uh, it could be used sometimes even as a diagnostic procedure in a few cases when you get something really strange happening with a module. So just wanted to clarify that because again, this is a really common misnomer in the field and a very misunderstood subject. People buy a scan tool and they expect, oh, it says it has cloud programming for BMW or for Volkswagen or for Mazda or whatever brand it might be. And then they get upset because it can't program a specific module. You need to manage your expectations and understand that this is not the scan tool manufacturer's fault. They are not the OEM. They do not have access to all the files and they never will. That's totally normal. So there's no reason to be lighting up your scan tool manufacturer about this or yelling at them or giving them a hard time. They are providing this service as a convenience to you and a value added, not as a one-stop shop solution. Again, that needs to be clearly understood because there are far too many support calls to many different uh, scan tool manufacturers where people are having meltdowns and yelling at the scan tool manufacturer for a lack of coverage on a specific vehicle or module. Again, you need to manage your expectations. Cloud-based programming is merely a bonus, not a primary solution. I like to tell shops the best way to look at it is it's a potential chance where you get to keep 100% of a programming fee you charge a customer. Now, if you're using OEM software and either a J2534 or the OEM interface, then you are going to be paying an additional cost for that software, whether that's a one-time fee, a combination of one-time fees, or potentially a yearly subscription to have access to that OEM programming software. You need to understand that in those cases, obviously you're gonna have a cost, right? You're gonna have to mark that up you're going to have to pass that cost along to the customer. If you have cloud-based programming and the tool provider happens to have that cloud file for you, then guess what? You get to keep the entire programming fee now. On the other hand, if you do not have access to that and the cloud doesn't happen to have the file for your specific module, now you're going to need to use other means 
in order to get that module programmed. So again, just some clarification points that you need to be aware of. Option two. So option one we said was cloud-based programming. Option two, we're talking about J2534. Now you're going, what's that? Okay, so in blunt, simple terms, J2534 is a standardized protocol, if you will, that the manufacturers of various vehicles have standardized in cooperation to make it so there is a universalized style interface like a Card Act 3 or the Top Don MDCI or the Maxi Flash VCMI or the Bosch Master Tech 2, that all of those individual pieces of hardware can talk in the same overall language, using the same overall methodology, etc., to the vehicle via the OEM software. So essentially, they are, we, we like to call them pass throughs, right? So essentially, what we're doing is bridging the OEM software to the vehicle. That's what we're doing. Now, you ask yourself, well, okay, so can I do everything with the J2534? No, you cannot. Now, there's some other considerations you need to understand with respect to J2534. Which specific modules you can program using J2534 protocols is going to be dependent on OEM. Some OEMs will allow you to program any module using a J2534 pass-through and a J2534 specific software that the OEM provides. Other manufacturers will lock down which modules you are permitted to program using a J2534 device and their J2534 software. So again, very important that you understand the difference. Now, there's some other caveats to using J2534. Number one, not every J2534 device is gonna work with every OEM brand of software. Some of the J2534 physical hardware has greater compatibility with larger groups of OEMs. Other ones do not. Let's just say this is really no different than what you find with scan tools in the aftermarket. Most likely, you will need more than one J2534 if you are going to successfully do a lot of J2534 programming. You, you can't just buy one interface and expect it to do everything. Unfortunately, that is not realistic. Now, there are some, again, that may be more compatible than others, but it is just important to remember, you are still limited. You are still not at the same level as the dealer. You do not have access to everything they do by using J2534. Obviously, we are one step closer to the OEM level of uh, abilities with a J2534 than we are with the cloud-based programming. Now, the other thing you need to understand, and this applies not only to J2534, but this also applies to OEM software programming if we go to the next level, which we will cover in the following slides. You need a specialized laptop. You cannot just grab any old laptop slap the OEM software or J2534 compliant OEM software on the laptop and away you go. I'm sorry, it just does not work that way. There are a number of different specific things about each vehicle manufacturer's software that not only can conflict with each other, uh, they can have specific requirements with respect to drivers, uh, various software that Windows has to have installed. There are a number of different curveballs. And if you think that you are going to simply just pull out a laptop and do this and do it easily, you're wrong. It's not that simple. It's not cut and dry. And this creates a ton of headaches, not only for you, but for your shop. If you plan to get into J2534 or purchase OEM interfaces, you need to buy a specialized setup laptop. Now, I would recommend autorescuetools.com. They will build you a custom laptop you tell them which vehicle manufacturers you would like to do programming on and whether or not your plan is to use the J2534 option or if your plan is to buy some OEM interfaces or both, and then they will set the laptop up accordingly for you. The, the laptop will then be ready to go right out of the box when you get the, the, uh, the laptop in the mail, and then you'll be ready to do the programming for each of the vehicle manufacturers that you would like to program. Now, the other thing you need to understand, programming with all the different OEM software is a massive learning curve. Whether we're talking about the J2534 compliance software 
and I'll move my bubble here so you can see the bottom of the slide here a little better. Um, but you need to understand that each manufacturer has uh, different specific processes, procedures, the software workflow is different. Everything about it is not gonna be the same, right? So we really need to understand that this isn't like, hey, I can just go, oh, I'm gonna do GM today and tomorrow I'll do Nissan and it'll be exactly the same. It'll be easy to understand. No, it is not. If you wanna get into programming, you need to do training. Training is a mandatory requirement if you expect to do this, number one, competently and professionally. So to that end, if you would like to do training and you want to educate yourself on how you do programming on a wide variety of vehicles, I would recommend going to l1training.com. This is Keith Perkins' website. He has a great deal of training on all different OEMs and many, many videos available to teach you how to do programming on a wide variety of vehicles. There's just no substitute for experience. However, training is a great starting point if you are expecting to be able to jump in and do any of this stuff right out of the gate. So again, if you're gonna get a laptop and you're gonna do this stuff, I would recommend go to autorescuetools.com, order a customized laptop, let them know which vehicles you want to do programming with, and then, Go to l1training.com and spend the money, invest in your training, and learn how to do programming the right way. All right, so we'll jump on to the next slide here. So now option three. We talked about cloud-based programming. We talked about J2534 with a generic pass-through interface. The last option we want to cover here is option, well, okay, second to last option is the OEM interface or platform. Now this is quite simply, what we're talking about here is the OEM level interface. So we're talking about the exact hardware that the vehicle manufacturers, dealers use to program vehicles. So whether we're talking about the Chrysler MDP, which is their Micropod, uh, the VCM3 for Ford, the uh, VAS 6154, which is Volkswagen, the ICOM Next, which is uh, BMW, the VI3, which is uh, Nissan, the MDI-2, which is GM, or uh, obviously the Land Rover, which I completely forget what their interface is called, but this is just some examples, right? There are OEM interfaces for every manufacturer, and each one of those interfaces gives you a dealer level of access to all of the functions that the dealer can do. So again, that's with respect to programming modules. Uh, in many cases, you can get access to the factory scan tool software uh, and view it through by connecting with their factory interface to the car. This can give you a level of access to car information that you just simply cannot get anywhere else. So it's a really good thing to invest in if you do some very specific vehicle manufacturers, right? Uh, if you do a ton of GM, it makes a lot of sense to invest in the GM factory interface. If you do a ton of Volkswagen, it makes sense to invest in the factory interface, right? If you do all makes and all models, and it's pretty infrequent that you program a specific vehicle, probably makes more sense to stick with J2534, accomplish what you can use in the J2534 and outsource or contract out anything that you can't cover with J2534. So again, this is something you wanna understand. Uh, again, there's a huge advantage to getting the OEM interfaces. Number one, a lot of them are actually on back order right now, so it is difficult to get them but it does, uh, number two, it does give you a huge level of access to things and capabilities that you just fundamentally won't have access to elsewhere. Um, you need to be careful when you're buying OEM interfaces that you buy them from a legitimate vetted source. There are many clones and fakes out there with respect to the OEM interfaces. And in many cases, the OEM software will recognize that and block you from doing things. So just keep that in mind. If you're going to purchase an OEM interface, you need to make sure that it's an authorized supplier selling the product. Now you're going, who's an authorized supplier? Well, in many cases, the dealer is the authorized supplier. Uh, if there are other aftermarket tool companies, some of them do have uh, OEM interface access and are authorized suppliers who can sell you the OEM interface. So, you know, do your research, find out which vendors are authorized and make sure you're buying from a legitimate source. So. Again, one other note on this is you do need to have a specially built laptop if you're going to buy the OEM interfaces, because again, 
the software that is being used by each vehicle manufacturer. There are many considerations with regard to hardware profile of the computer, software profile of the computer, everything the PC that you're going to use for programming. There are a lot of specific caveats to how it has to be set up, all the stuff that has to be installed or not installed, and where the software lives uh, as far as if it lives on the same partition of the hard drive with another vehicle manufacturer or it has to be isolated to its own partition. So again, if you're going this route or J2534, you're still going to need a specialized laptop. Uh, some of the kits that you buy with the OEM interfaces include a laptop, in which case you would not need uh, to have a specialized laptop built. You could just buy an all-in-one solution with the OEM laptop and the hardware. So some other considerations, uh, again, my little head bubble here is blocking a little, so we'll move it. Um, these are some things you really need to be conscious of. And again, if you want to know more about this subject, you're going to need to do some more education and training. Brand new OEM dealer modules, those can be programmed with the OEM factory software, or in some cases, J2534 compliant OEM software. Uh, again, some manufacturers have separate software, some have uh, one solution, and it just recognizes which interface you're using. Everyone's different, but again, you need to understand that an OEM dealer sold module is the only guaranteed this will work with the OEM software. The second option is remanufactured or aftermarket remanufactured modules. Some of these modules come blank. Some of these modules come with software on them. Some of them come with software that the aftermarket company has tried to engineer themselves. There's a lot of curveballs there. It can get into a lot of difficult headaches that are sometimes not simple to solve. So you need to be careful if you're doing remanufactured aftermarket modules. Um, my personal preference is to stay away from them. Uh, again, this is something you need to educate yourself on and make judgment calls. But again, you need to have some understanding that an aftermarket remanufactured module is not the same as a brand new module that comes directly from the dealer. So you go, okay, well then I'll just use a used module from the exact vehicle. Not so fast. Sometimes this is not possible. Some vehicle manufacturers prevent you from using a used module in certain situations. Now some vehicle manufacturers, this is a broad based blanket thing that they have imposed across a, uh, a wide variety of vehicles and a wide variety of modules. Other vehicle manufacturers, it's highly dependent on what specific module you have, uh, what specific vehicle you have, and is more of a function of who the supplier of that module was to the vehicle manufacturer. So for instance, it could be a Siemens su supplied module, uh, Continental or Siemens, and maybe this particular Siemens or Continental module cannot be uh, transferred from one used vehicle to another used vehicle. And again, that could be a function of something that was specifically engineered about that exact module on that exact car. Some of these things are easily found on the internet through Google searching. Some of them you need to join specific groups, uh, Facebook groups, for instance, where they talk about module cloning and things of that nature. You can oftentimes find answers to those questions there. But again, in many cases, you can use a used module and the OEM software or the OEM software that's J2534 compliant will program that used module. But in some cases, that used module will be blocked. So you will install it in the vehicle. You'll try to use the factory software or the factory software with J2534 compliance, and it will not program to the vehicle. In those situations, we go to option four, which is the final version of programming that I really like to see. And this would be cloning. So cloning is something that has become increasingly necessary in our field. Uh, there are more and more modules where, like I said, we do have specific vehicle manufacturers or specific modules in specific vehicles where they are blocked from being installed in a used condition. So you go, okay, so what can I do about that? There are specialized tools that you can invest in that will allow you to clone some of these modules. Now, there is, again, just like any scan tool or a J2534, there is not one simple tool that does every module. Even some of the most expensive cloning tools do not have the capability to clone every module on every car. Why? The development costs to be able to figure out how to do this are astronomical for these companies. 
So it is not something simple where they can just go, oh, this is easy. We'll just uh, write this new software that will allow us to clone this module that's, you know, just came out last year that's difficult to clone. It's not that simple. So again, you need to understand that if you're going to go down this road, it's more likely than not going to result in a significant investment in tooling. It's not going to be one tool solves all your problems. And it's also going to require a great deal of education. Some module cloning is fairly straightforward and simple. Some module cloning is highly complex. And there are many specific caveats or rules with respect to a specific individual module. Uh, many of these things are just not cut and dry. You need to make a competent evaluation of whether or not this makes financial sense for you to get into. Uh, you know, I, I just I want people to understand, you know, if there's a tool that does a lot of common modules, let's say, let's say transmissions, right? Maybe there's a specific brand of transmission that you have that you know you can't use a used transmission control unit in because it's internal to the transmission and they don't allow used. Maybe you find a tool that clones that module for you and you do those transmissions all the time. You do five or six of them a year. It probably makes sense to buy that tool if you can find a reasonable cost tool, right? Because now you can provide a service to the customer. You can charge the customer for that programming service, the cloning. And of course, we can keep a vehicle on the road longer for the customer's sake, while also providing a service that they might not even be able to perform at the dealer. So this, again, it's an advanced level of service, but it does require specialized education and information uh, in order to understand not only how to do it, when to do it, uh, but everything in between. So just wanted to give you an example. This is an example of a TSB by GM that covers a bunch of modules that cannot be used in a used condition. So they have a TSB out, PIP 46, 4670, and the suffix on the end of that bulletin, uh, I believe the current revision was J. There's probably another one, and usually they just go through the alphabet for the revisions. But they give you a master list of all the vehicles where they advise against using used control modules. Now, what does that mean? Again, that generally means the manufacturer is blocking you from using a used module. So if you put a used module in any of these vehicles, it's not going to let you do it. Now. This would be a situation where cloning would be something you could look at that could solve that problem for you. So just wanted to make you aware of that. If you are going to go down the cloning module uh, path and you decide that that's what you want to do, there are aftermarket resources out there for training. Uh, the primary resource that I'm familiar with is the website link I have here, autotechelec.com. So these folks, uh, they provide training classes on cloning modules and teach you how to do these operations on a wide variety of specific modules and specific vehicles. So if you want to go down that road, I, again, training is crucial, right? So I've provided some training resources. If you want to go down each of these paths, training is crucial. If you want to be successful at any of these operations, you need to invest in that and you need to properly understand what it is that you're getting into. You can't just jump in the deep end of the pool and expect to succeed. It's not going to happen. Uh, there's maybe some genius level people who can figure it out just like that. But the vast majority of people, it's not going to be cut and dry and it's not going to be simple. So if you want to go down that road, strongly recommend that you invest in some training. Again, whether that's talking about J2534 or buying the OEM interface style programming, or if we are getting into cloning and EEPROM related stuff. So again, uh, just wanted to kind of clarify that. So we'll go back to our overview here, just as a recap. So again, what did we talk about in the video here? We talked about when we're programming modules, why we're programming modules, uh, what, what are the situations that specifically call for that? We talked about the how. So in what way are we able to accomplish programming and the different means? So we had the cloud-based programming. We had OEM software J2534 compliant option. We had OEM software with OEM interface. And then we had cloning or uh, used module copying, if you will. Uh, cloning is probably the best way to characterize that. Uh, so those are the things that we went over with respect to how it's accomplished. And then finally, we talked about remembering that there is a difference between a brand new OEM supplied dealer uh, control module 
a used module and when this may or may not work due to restrictions by either the vehicle manufacturer themselves or the provider of the hardware module to the vehicle manufacturer. And then lastly, uh, remanufactured modules and some of the potential curveballs or caveats to those. So I hope this video was educational and helpful to you. Uh, again, if you want to get deeper into any of these subjects, check out the three train or the two training websites I mentioned. And if you plan to get into J2534 compliant programming or OEM level interface programming, get in touch with the folks at Auto Rescue Tools and have them build you a custom laptop specifically for whatever vehicle brands you would like to do programming on. So appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. I hope it was educational for you. Please take what I've said here to heart. This is the kind of stuff that you need to be aware of if you're expecting to do these operations. And if you want to do this professionally, you got to know this stuff. And you can't point the fingers at people who's not at fault, right? You can't blame the scan tool manufacturers for not having every file on every car. We cannot blame anyone but ourselves for a lack of knowledge on how to set up a laptop with respect to programming. None of that is anyone's responsibility but yours. It's your job to know whether or not something is going to work. It's your job to know how to do it. It's your job to be able to relay that information to the customer. As a technician or an owner, you need to have an understanding of all of these aspects of things if you expect to do this service. If you decide that this is cost prohibitive to get into this stuff, outsource it to a competent provider, whether that's a mobile diagnostic and programming technician uh, or service, or if you use a remote programming service, Outsource it if you don't feel that you can become competent and educated on this subject. So appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. If you got questions, feel free to drop them in the comment box. Uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to watch. Again, I'm Hawken, and uh, this has been a shotgun diagnostics video on uh, basic programming overview.